This time we're going to have some critically important news on the troublesome sander, a random clip of Alan at dusk after working on his deck, but mostly news, although not a conclusion, of the engine bay extraction ducting saga. Steadfast Allen viewers will recall the ducting port I put in yonks ago, the one that's designed to allow hot or dirty air from the engine bay to escape the boat. I finally discovered a perfect coupler for this tricky situation. There's an exterior nozzle you'll see later, and it needs to connect securely to a conduit bringing air up from the engine bay. I finally tracked one down that had perfect, yet dissimilar, sized endings at a right angle and made from grippy silicon. It needs to attach here, onto the right angle to round shape adapter. I've also securely fitted a velcro restraint onto the insulation, but the super lightweight ducting will be friction fitted snugly at both top and bottom too. I was pleased I could get the black right angle in a snug fit, and not made from rigid plastic, otherwise I might have had to have made a custom seal and perhaps a mounting bracket too. All that was then needed was marking where the velcro on the wall was so I could bond a strip onto the ducting itself. I find PVC plastic accepts good quality adhesives quite well, which is a welcome break from the slipperier, low surface energy nylons and polyethylenes that I often have to work with for cold weather applications. This will be the air's route from interior to exterior. The flat ducting is to make sure it doesn't encroach on cabin space, and then there's a smooth exit route to minimise disruption of the airflow. Also, I tried to avoid area restriction, as we found previously how small fans can struggle to overcome back pressure. There may well be a need for a valve of some sort to stop moisture getting back up into the system, but we'll see. In crazy weather, it would take just seconds to pull everything back inside and seal the port. Now there's the inlet to sort out. I know I'm drawing this ducting out into something of a future third episode saga, and let's remember that it's just a plastic pipe with a few extras on the end, but the placing of this still has to be decided. There's a compromise for all the options. I'll let this charming and knowledgeable chap explain fully. I was really hoping to have this one completely finished and sorted for you in this episode, but it's dragging on a bit. It will end up being in a third episode. So this rather, I don't think it's over-engineered, this necessary ducting system here uh, is now nicely uh, connected to the, uh, to the insulation with a removable bit of Velcro. It's worth saying that there will be two fans in the end, but I've only got one at the moment, so that's why I've blanked off the other area. It means that they can both share the load. Also, what I now need to do is deal with the location of the duct itself. I've got two options really. The first option is to just do a simple option and have it either fitted on the top or on the bottom and then basically glass round and then insulate a little wall along there to mean that when there's a panel across here, the entire thing is sealed and air is being drawn up from only one place, the engine bay. That's straightforward, um, but then I lose a little bit of storage cu uh, cubby hole here but also I, it makes the shape of the, uh, the wall I need to put in quite complicated. Another option is to move it all the way over here and put it into the panel that's going to be removable. That's an option Then I can simply put a wall straight up here um, and have the maximum amount of cubbyhole for storage. That's an option. Or I could try and actually move it around here so it's at an angle and comes in the side wall. But there definitely needs to be a partition here to obviously make it airtight so that the duct is only pulling air from where it should be bring it, bring it from. It does also need to be accessible because maybe the fan needs to be rewired at some point or maybe there's a problem with one of them, they need to be replaced or maybe get something gets stuck in, stuck in the ducting, maybe some moisture, anything like that. So let's try and make it not too built in because then as with anything that's built in too deeply, getting it out again later on uh, doubles the amount of work time and labor. Other than that, the ducting is now, on this end at least, pretty much done. I'm very happy about how it moves from inside to outside of the boat. This most likely spells the end for these wooden dividers, but perhaps they'll find a new home later on. A sad loss, but this is the cutthroat arena of Alan's conversion. No room for stragglers. Now let's go up onto the deck and sort out the anti-slip coating there. Months and months ago I put down a basic anti-slip with a normal marine paint, but I want to extend it and use a more resilient coating. Naturally, this meant plenty of sanding, and I have to break some bad news to you. This was the last stand for my trusty orbital sander that I was having, I thought, minor issues with in the last episode. It turned out that it was even more unhappy than I thought. First, the sanding pad screws loosened, and then again having been retightened, then a hex bolt loosened and punched straight through the sanding disc. Finally, having reassembled everything, there was smoke and the smell of burning. It turned out the seals and some of the innards had nearly caught fire. 
There was no obvious blockages, so I'm guessing something wore out and began rubbing. Surely when a budget-priced, yet trusty, machine opts to repeatedly disassemble itself and then spontaneously combust, instead of spinning around in circles like it's supposed to, you have to accept that it's all over. A lighter weight replacement is on order, conveniently in time for some overhead work underneath Alan's hull. Given this timing, any rumours of sabotage to the old sander are entirely unfounded. We more or less got there though, and I finished off the final bit and the areas a sander can't get to with some 120 grit emery cloth. I admit I used to try and sand off small areas of old dry duct tape adhesive and other imperfections, but it gums up sandpaper pretty quickly. What seems like a shortcut ends up being anything but. So acetone gets it off, a powerful solvent I've learned to only use when I don't care about the surface finish. It dulled the polyurethane gloss paint when I tried this elsewhere a few weeks ago. Another false shortcut I learned the hard way. I needed to carefully sand back the repair to the panel I cut out in episode 21 until it was flush. It was a pretty belt and braces repair where I cut in a groove and overlaid glass fibre to the perimeter. I didn't feel that a mere line of sealant would be enough. Before coating could commence, naturally a good wash down with sugar soap to degrease and clear any dust or gunk. I started off with a brush around all the sprinkler railing mounts and carefully covered the paintable sealant right the way up to the stainless steel. I'm using the spare epoxy primer I used on Alan's underside. It's tough and the non-gloss finish is fine as I mixed in anti-slip granules. I did think about having a smooth zone running underneath all the railings as no one is going to want to stand there and anti-slip as hard as a clean and smooth paint of course, but in reality the whole area is going to be periodically cleaned with a pressure hose or a mop and it will make little difference. Anti-slip, all over, it was then. The bulk I did with a roller. I didn't really know if this was going to work with the anti-slip. Initially the gritty granules bunched up in clumps but after a few gentle rolls it evened out nicely. The final zone up to the edges needed me to deploy acrobatic balancing skills, especially since the anti-slip isn't yet in place. I've said I wanted to extend the black anti-slip zone, largely because I thought there may be circumstances where a crew member wants to walk down the outside of the railings. Clipped on of course, if at sea. The anti-slip epoxy therefore meets the tough orange polyurethane paint in a neat line around the deck. I was lazy and didn't wear gloves for this paint job, and at the end here you can just about see me clean off a few splatters using a product that I bought merely to get the basket total over the free delivery threshold for an online order that I made. But what a happy accident. It's awesome, and as well as being orange, you rub it in without water and then rinse it off. It takes off adhesives and really gungy paints without having to wipe your skin with powerful solvents. Before I go, I have persevered with the sleeping platform that I measured poorly in episode 23, and the extension means that it's nearly ready. Thank you for the naming suggestions that you gave me in the comments. This one will be called The Planker. What a plonker, you little plonker. And the properly made one I'll do next will be Max Plank. And I'll do some more electrics in an upcoming episode, as we've been quite paint heavy over the last few weeks. I know you lot like some variety. So until then, bye.